From 1934 to 1943, a group of photographers took hundreds of thousands of images, mostly on black and white film. They were part of the U.S. Farm Security Administration's ambitious project to document the lives of farming families across the United States as they weathered the Great Depression. Some of these images were widely published and became famed images of their era. But a great number did not make the cut. To support this monumental project, many photographers were hired and given substantial leeway to go where they wanted and take photos of whatever they saw fit. Sounds like a dream come true for a photographer, right? Well, there were some catches. Once photographers took photos, they had very little say-so in what happened to them, where the images were published, and even what captions were attached to the published images. The photographers sent rolls of undeveloped film to a central location to be developed and for images to be selected for further use. What you see here are a rather small selection of what by some estimates were 87,000 images that were killed by having a hole punched directly into the negative. For perspective, an estimated 164,000 images were submitted. This means that over half of the images were killed, never to see the light of day again. Or so was intended, until a number of these photos were rediscovered and filed into the Library of Congress, where they are now publicly available. Among photographers who worked on this project were some of the greats of their day, like Dorothy Lange, Walker Evans, and Gordon Park. Who knows how many of their photos were destroyed in this mass culling. Upon seeing these images so defiled, most people will ask, why? How did this happen? Was there any point? The answer I've discovered will probably not satisfy many people, nor will it surprise them. In short, the answer is government bureaucracy. Publication and preservation of these images was left to a man by the name of Roy Stryker, a former economist turned director of the FSA's documentary photography program. And if he didn't like an image, he killed it, quite literally by punching a hole directly into the negative, making it useless for publication. So much for preservation. Anyone who's ever handled film will know this is a rather unorthodox approach, as notes, edits, and publication selections are generally confined to a printed contact sheet separate from the actual negatives. But Roy did not operate this way. Perhaps it was a cost or time-saving measure, Perhaps it was a strong arm effort to ensure that only his choices saw the light of day. But at this point, we'll probably never know his reasoning as he passed away in 1975. With some images, it's easy to see why they were killed. Some were out of focus. Some had poor composition. Many just seemed far too mundane for publication. But regardless, all of these images are a record of day-to-day -day life in the Great Depression. Roy's methods may have been harsh, but they were strangely effective. Most images were killed with a single shot to the subject's head or hands, destroying the main point of interest, and often making a subject unidentifiable. I also couldn't help but notice that in a number of images, Roy had a strange habit of punching a hole through the subject's crotch. I'll leave you to speculate as to why he chose this particular approach. Some images have multiple holes, with no apparent reasoning for the extra effort. Some images have slashes or writing directly on the negative, in addition to holes punched through them, perhaps suggesting multiple editors reviewing them, each leaving their own mark. But a number of images are left with a strange, eerie black star looming over a desolate landscape, or ominously hovering just over a person's shoulder, creating a strange, almost surreal image. The fact that these images never have associated captions, and rarely have names, adds to the sense of mystery and makes them all the more foreign to the casual observer. But despite this seeming and often frustrating lack of information, a lot of inferences can still be made just from looking at the images. Scenes of everyday life are abound. Faces can be made out in a great many images, allowing the viewer to connect on some level with people who, in all likelihood, are no longer with us. Despite the flaws, these images still achieve their intended purpose of providing a tiny, fleeting glimpse into the lives of people, and a hint of their struggles and accomplishments. Some archivists who have studied both killed and published images have suggested that many of the images were killed due to their duplicate nature, leaving only the best out of a series of similar images. But many of the images I've seen missing their center seem on par with anything published. 
Some who knew Roy claimed that he had very high standards and would not tolerate images that were even slightly out of focus. Others have suggested he had a very strong affinity for the use of tripods. From my personal observances, it appears that he didn't like images that were shot on the fly. So what did the photographers who took these photos think of this treatment? We don't know in some cases, but we do have a few surviving accounts. Photographer Edwin Roskam was quoted as saying, It was barbaric to me. I'm sure that some very significant pictures have in that way been killed off. Because there's no way of telling, no way, what photograph will come to life and when. Another FSA photographer, Bin Shan, referred to the practice as dictatorial, saying, He ruined quite a number of my pictures. Some of them were incredibly valuable. He didn't understand that at the time. Later on, during the war, when I took a look for a negative, he punched a hole through it. It was an invaluable document of what life was like in 1935, and when I went looking for it in 1943 or 44, it didn't exist anymore. It is known that as time passed, Roy stopped his habit of perforating negatives and moved on to using contact sheets and stamps, which some still claim he used very aggressively. But regardless of the reasoning, these holes had a strange character to these images, a unique feature that I've never seen anywhere else. The holes are literal missing pieces in photographs of a society that must have seemed to many at the time on the verge of collapsing. In hindsight, we can make the assumption that many of the young men in these images would go on to fight in the battlefields of Europe and the remote islands of the Pacific, and many would never return home. In a strange, unforeseen way, these holes could be seen to represent the gaps they left in the hearts and minds of those who survived them. But that's a very modern interpretation, aided by historic hindsight, that the photographers could never have imagined when taking these photos. In modern times, many critics lament Stryker's heavy-handed methods. But it is worth noting that despite his lack of care in handling these negatives, he managed to hire many of the great photographers of the day and gave them the funding and support to create some of the greatest images in American history. Despite his flawed process, he was a central character in accomplishing something extraordinary, something that has not been truly repeated in 80 years' time. On a side note, there is a movement to repair what images can be saved using modern photo editing software, and many of the results I've seen achieved are impressive. But it seems doubtful all of these images can be saved. But I digress, that is an entirely different story. So why have I decided to highlight these obscure, flawed images that were never meant to see the light of day? Despite the fact that these images were relegated to the trash pile of history and scarred by a short-sighted bureaucrat, they survived to our modern era. And even today they can be seen in all their imperfections. Some have even gone so far as to create gallery displays featuring many of the images. As I scrolled through the volumes of these images, I wondered what kind of future exists for our digital images of the modern era? Will they still be usable in 80 years' time? How will time treat our hard drives? And will operating systems of the future recognize proprietary raw image files? Or even JPEGs for that matter? I don't have the answers to these questions. But then again, no one does. In the future, will I and countless other photographers be thought of as careless, short-sighted Roy's? Or... Will we not be remembered at all?